Hey guys, it's Jack. I just wanted to talk to you today about a way that you can help support the podcast. If you're not already, we would really appreciate it. If you guys went and reviewed us on Apple or Spotify, those reviews really help people find the podcast and help it get recognized. And, uh, you know, if you've been enjoying the show, we really appreciate your support. Another thing that you can do to support the channel is to become a Patreon member. So we have Patreon memberships that start at just $5 a month. And when you sign up, you get access to all of our episodes ad-free. Uh, that's the big bonus for that. I mean, we also do some Patreon bonus episodes for our subscribers. Uh, but this is the, the biggest and best way that you can support the Team House channel and podcast uh, if you'd like to. And we really appreciate that. So go in and check us out at patreon.com slash the team house. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. I'm Andy Milburn. I'm Jason Lyons. I'm Dimitri Contacos, the producer of Eyes On and the team house. Well, everyone, this every morning, I mean, every time we do this, they say there's a lot going on. We've been lucky. And it's a lot, the world has been unlucky that there is a tremendous amount going on. Uh, D, do you, any any preference? I, I was going to kick off with uh, an extraordinary, I think it's an extraordinary story. Khomeini, uh, uh, the, the supreme, oh, um, God damn it. Let's start it again. Let's start again. <laughs> Fuck. I don't know I, how I messed that up. I want to leave that in. It's, a, it's the supreme leader. I was about to say supreme. Okay. Is there's nothing in there? There's not other like uh, adjective in there? No, it's just supreme leader. Okay. Yeah, I, I forget his first name. Ah, uh, and it doesn't matter. Fuck it. Iran's. Yeah, it's his first name. Ali. Ali. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on, <laughs> come on. All right, all right, man. All right, Andrew. That's the easiest okay. name, bro. Here, here we go. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Eyes On. I'm Andy Morden. I'm Jason Lyons. I'm Dimitri Contacos. Well, we've got a packed program. Oh, God, that's such a cliche, but it is true. And uh, in, in our case, it's going to be a cliffhanger as usual. Uh, thanks to a lot of things going on in the world. It's fortunate for us, not so fortunate for the world. D, what do you, uh, what do you, what do you want to kick off with? And I mean, the biggest, the biggest the biggest news that, Yeah, that's kind of been carrying on into this week is uh, what's gone on between Iran and Israel and uh the weighted yeah. uh, Iranian response to is the Israel's hit in uh, Syria. Yeah, excellent point, D. You know, when you when you filter through everything that is going on, and I know people gravitate down to kind of uh, uh, what's happening in Gaza and the discussions of Rafa, and we'll touch on that. But you know, the real issue uh, geopolitically and certainly for the United States is uh, you know what's what the worst could be yet to come. And uh, indeed, that is what uh, the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khomeini, uh, I forgot his first name, by the way, and, and D kindly reminded me they are on first name terms. <laughs> well, he, Khomeini is, uh, you know, he's up with the times and he, he's got a Twitter account. Uh, and uh, I don't know if any of you subscribe to it, but uh, I do not. And I do not speak Hebrew. Uh, but surprisingly enough, get this, the supreme leader of Iran, Ali Khomeini, Posted on Twitter in Hebrew today, right? Friendly message for the state of Israel. And uh, he said Israel must be punished for attacking. Uh, and he's talking about the strike that we discussed last week. So if you haven't seen last week's episode, we're not going to do it again. Please, after this one, go back and see it. It is a really, really good one. It's the second best episode after this one. But in any case, last episode, we talked about uh, the assassination of uh, actually of seven Quds Force uh, related officers in Damascus um, and possibly a senior member of uh, Lebanese Hezbollah. And three of those commanders uh, were literally the three most senior Quds Force commanders aside from uh, the Supreme Commander himself, uh, um, Kani. Anyway, so these three guys are whacked uh, mysteriously. No one knows who by, right? And um, very, it's actually... Uh, an extremely accurate precision strike that shows that whoever conducted it is capable of conducting such a strike when they have to. The the uh, the embassy that was struck was right next to the Canadian embassy. Um, I'm sure that rattled the uh, you know the the teacups um, in the conference room next door. I'm not you know I'm not being chocolate about this. It's I guess I am, but it, it's a serious issue. Obviously, um, uh, the 
the you know this back and forth on whether the building itself was part of the Iranian embassy it was adjacent to it and it was really kind of an annex to the embassy we have the same thing and we count it as being part of our own diplomatic terrain again I'm just stating facts okay and um that it's normally off limits like oh 100 percent right yeah by you know international international law remember when we hit the uh I mean, mistakes happen. Remember when we yeah. whacked the, uh, who, who can Chinese. forget that, right? The yeah. Chinese embassy in Belgrade yeah. in 1993, killing a, uh, a janitor, sadly, who, who was not Chinese. Um, but, um, but that launched, I mean, Chinese theorists are almost universal in agreement that that yeah. launched, that was the catalyst that launched China onto the trajectory yeah. Uh, that it is on now of of uh, extreme competition. Um, so yeah, these you, you know when people at the time punch the air and go, yeah, this rocks, man. Yeah, you know, get some. All cool, but the the ramifications mm. decades down the line at times um, are, uh, are are often far greater. You know, it's the whole butterfly wings thing. Sorry, I'm waxing philosophical, but yeah. The point is, this was a momentous thing. Um, it is. I would be very surprised if this does not result in um, activity that is more serious than anything that has happened to date. Um, you know, if you think of everything that had, you know, the Houthis plinking ships in the Red Sea, which actually is a pretty serious problem, probably the most serious problem um, aside from um, our you know what the, the alliance with uh with israel and and uh what it's um causing us right now uh but all of this all of this is potentially mere foreplay he uh which i know is not something you believe in um uh, you know kind of uh, for what for what possibly lies ahead and i'm not being an extreme you know i'm not being a chicken little here you know um those of your audience who are familiar with lebanese hezbollah uh will know that uh, that Hezbollah alone has the ability to wreak enormous damage on Israel, overcome, I mean, not overcome, but um, overwhelm the uh, Iron Dome system and, and at, you know, at, at the least serious cause thousands of casualties, very least uh, ramifications. But uh, as we discussed, you know, there's, it's unlikely to be uh, as, as, um, uh, as anodyne, right? As harmless as that, uh, because that's just more of the same. So, what what could happen? Um, I, you know, I'm I'm speculating here. Certainly, certainly a concerted rocket and missile attack from Hezbollah into Israel. Um, probably, I mean, certainly uh, aligned with um, the Houthis plinking at Elat in southern Israel with uh, with drones, long range missiles, and I. I, when I mentioned the Houthis doing this, I, you know, if I'm appearing to be laughing, I, it, it just still sounds, I mean, it, it sounds to me, it, they, they really are um, doing what the Marines are supposed to be doing against the Chinese in the, uh, in the Pacific, right? And they're doing it quite well you know, for all their lack of apparent sophistication. Anyway, so all of these proxy groups will be doing stepped up uh, action, but I don't, you know, you it, What's coming from Hezbollah is like nothing the world has seen, uh, you know, attacks on Israel. That's, you know, every, everyone is aware of that in Israel. Um, but that could not be the least, you know, that might not be the least of it. Now, Iran, now, that 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 threat from uh, or, or promise from the Israeli defense minister today, uh, when he said, you know, Israel, he announced uh, on TV right after reading Khomeini's tweet, which he could read because it was kindly in Hebrew. Um, Gallant said uh, that Israel will attack in the territory of any country that attacks him. All right. Now, there is, if if that does happen, uh, Iran is certainly in trouble. Um, yes, you know, Israel is in a nuclear nation, blah, blah, blah. But, I, but Gallant's not talking about nuclear strikes. Israel doesn't have to do that. Israel can wreak incredible a, a lot of damage uh, on Iran, and and Israel is um, one of the probably the only friendly intelligence agency who have people on the ground in Iran. Um, Jason, would you hazard a, a guess that that might be correct? 
Uh, yeah, I would I would say that's probably more most likely the case. Yeah. Yeah, I was hoping you would say I can neither confirm nor <laughs> yeah. Well, I um, can, but <laughs> but but anyway, look, I I will show up in a moment. But there's a really there's a, there's a kind of you know if we go down to the micro level, um, this is kind of you know the long reach of Mossad around all this shit's going on and then big like in big uh, big arena global arena. Uh, Lebanese papers today report money changer accused by Israel of sending funds to Hamas found shot to death. OK, so no surprise there. Um, goes on to say, you know, Israel accused the money changer of transferring money to terrorist groups in Gaza before uh, the attacks. And and uh, Shin, uh, Shin Bad, the IDF uh, and Mossad have have uh, in their interrogations uh, have specifically narrowed it, have focused on this guy. So they're clearly after him. And then, according to this, uh, this time not not Lebanese papers, but Saudi papers, um, he, uh, he he was he just the money changer went home. He's like fifty seven year old dude. Um, and then when they checked the security cameras, he just never came out. And they found his body with seven seven uh, bullets in him. Um, very very accurate, you know. Uh, uh, someone someone. Uh, not your run-of-the-mill guy, okay, right. in, in Lebanon. Um, and in case you weren't convinced that it might be an intelligence agency, they found two Glock pistols in the water cooler. And not the water cooler, the uh, system. And um, uh, and the money changer. And the house was full of money. He's a money changer. Mm. And nothing was taken. He even had a like a bag of money in his hand. So very clearly... Yeah. A message to encourage yeah. the others, right? So, <laughs> yeah. you know, even when all this stuff's going on, Mossad isn't too busy uh, to, you know, to to whack, um, you know, a, a paycheck. Uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, early early paycheck guy, right? Who are the guys mm -hmm. who cash paychecks on in garrison towns for lance corporals uh, who don't have money? Oh, and, and those payday pay loan people. people. Yeah, that's right, payday <laughs> loan. Yeah. So anyway. Um, Oh, Paul said, guys, what do you, uh, anything, any, any thoughts, bitches, gripes, moans? So along those lines, I mean, this is on a bigger scale than just the uh, money changer. Do you think that Israel is capable of levying the same force against Hezbollah if things step up at the same time that they're running operations against Hamas? Or do you, like, if, if uh, let's just say yeah, Iran says, hey, as Hezbollah, you're off the chain. Could they, you know, uh, levy the same force? Jason, that's a great question. And, you know, the Israelis, they, the IEF high command is churning through this all the time. So, mm -hmm. all right, what did we see this week? We saw we saw um, all, all Israeli troops. Okay, so it was roughly, it, you know, it's difficult to, it, the way the Israelis task organized stuff. But they had... You know the equivalent of a division, right? A more than a division reinforced in Gaza. They have pulled everyone out um, except for one brigade uh, that is, you know, on the edge of Khan Yunus, uh, whose uh, whose interim role is just kind of refit there and and run raids as needed. Okay, so the rest of the IDF has been pulled out now. The Israeli MOD, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, the the uh, Kyria, the, their uh, Pentagon is saying, hey, look, this is just normal refit. This has nothing to do with the hostage deal or with the threat from Iran, all right? Now, we're going to talk about the hostage deal in a moment. I told you this is complicated. Yeah. Um, but but where are those units going? Yeah, indeed, they're going back to base to refit, um, but the training that they're jumping right into is very much oriented on Lebanon. Remember, they're coming out of urban areas. You guys all know you, you yeah. can't switch mindset However well trained you are, it's tough to switch mindset yeah. from that to you know the terrain in northern Lebanon, which is very different, right? It's open. Um, I mean, it, it's it's rural for a start. It's a different type of fighting. The enemy's different. Blah blah blah. So these units being brought out and retrained for the north. So at the same time, um, today Benny Gantz, uh, who's a member of the the cabinet, the war cabinet, and uh, possibly a future prime minister and for me, you, the United States is favorite. Mm. He said today, Hey, you know, we're, we're going on, we're going to take Rafa. The, the U S uh, has opposed, hasn't opposed 
a point blank a, a take going into Rafa. Uh, what the United States what is telling Israel on this, telling I mean, advising with the implicit threat of withholding or restricting the supply of arms. I said implicit because no one said that yet. What the U.S. is urging Israel to do is to move the civilian population in a practical way to a real safe haven. Um, there have been a lot of problems, I think, you know, even the Israelis might admit some of them about um, miscommunication and moving them into kill zones, all right? Well, this time the U.S. says, no, you, you're not going to clear an area and then move the U.S. population, I mean, move the civilian population to another area, then hit that area before you hit the you know, one you've just evacuated them from, which has happened. Um, I mean, uh, let me put it this way. The New York Times media, I can't personally verify that that has happened. Reportedly, that has happened, okay? Um, so that's the United States' stance. And then the U.S., you know, in the military um, angle, uh, is is advising rather than go in and occupy uh, Rafa in a, in a, there's a million and a half people in there, most of whom have already been displaced. Rather than go in and, and create another slaughterhouse, position yourself in FOBs, all right, around, you know, around Rafa, conduct patrols, raids in, targeted raids, you know, the stuff that we, counterinsurgency, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the United States' uh, argument. But remember, within the cabinet, Netanyahu relies on the far right-wingers for political power. And they are telling him they will dump him if he does not go into Rafa, mm -hmm. you know, in, in a kind of this apocalyptic way yeah. um, in, from the book of Revelations, right? Yeah. And and so, and Ben Gavir is is the leader of the, the right wing within the cabinet. Ben Gavir uh, is um, the security, a minister of security. Someone's going to correct me on this. Uh, he's going to Google this. Um, but he's a, he, he's got a senior position in the cabinet. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I just want to give you... I just want to give you some insight into how right wing these guys are. I know it seems strange. We're talking about the Jewish people, extreme right wing. Um, but some of you may remember back in, I think it was 1994, all right, before Dee was born. But there was there was a um there was an incident in uh on the Temple Mount, um, mm. and a a uh US and American Israeli called Barry Goldstein. Mm killed 29 palestinians wounded several hundred you know he he took a he took an assault rifle into um so much he took an assault rifle into al-aqsa mosque and, and just gunned down worshippers okay right and then he killed himself ben gavir has a picture that had a picture of this dude on the wall all right and and this was caught <laughs> this was caught Gosh. on yeah on tv <sighs> um i mean unbelievable He's a minister a of murder. national security. He, that's his hero. Yeah, minister of national security. And his hero is a mass murderer. I mean, this, can you put, I mean, we think we have problems. That is, that's effing scary. Yeah. That really is. I got you know, a question. Having a guy in, dry, in the driver's seat in a full scale war, all right, where, you know, a guy who has stated over and over again the way he talks about the Palestinians, they're subhuman, blah, blah. I mean, he doesn't use that term. But what he has said is you cannot separate, you cannot separate Hamas from the Palestinian people. He mm. said that repeatedly. Ugh. All right. We're not so we're not even going to try. That's the implication. And he keeps saying that. And and you can argue, you know, <clears throat> people have argued all they want. Hey, you know, the US manages not to do this stuff and um and, and against the far more capable enemy, you know, yes, we've made mistakes. Like, oh, I've, I've just brought on a lot of people are going to to criticize me for this. But come on, you guys, if you've been in the U.S. military, you know, we, we operate under different um, rules of engagement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we just do. And that's that's who we are. Um, I'm not saying I, I'm saying that I, I'm glad, uh, but I'm I'm not commenting uh, beyond that. But anyway, mm -hmm. so politically. Politically, there is some there is there is some um, dynamics. Meanwhile, you have ten th tens of thousands of. That's employees. a nice Andy. That's a nice way of saying like extremists politically in power, operating as the minister of national security 
and the prime minister, basically, who like takes his P's and Q's from that same right wing. I'll say it. Yeah. It's OK. I'm happy to say it. I don't give a shit one way or the other. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I think it's scary. I think extremist views in in, in any camp and there's you don't get much more extreme than that. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think that is. Yeah, certainly it's concerning. So, I got a question, too, yeah. about Rafa. So let's say Israel goes eventually when they go into Rafa and start like their uh, search and destroy campaign. Um. What does Egypt do? Because I feel like Egypt has said, like, you know, Rafa is a red line and, you know, they probably don't want a million Palestinian refugees in their country. Uh, what happens if, like, Egypt spins up their military and then you have Israel now uh, basically inflaming down. every person on their every person that they share a border with, they're inflaming, more or less, and Iran? Yeah. Now, interestingly, and that's a great point. So I brought that topic up actually with a senior IDF officer about Egypt. And um, he had a really interesting perspective. He said, hey, you, you know, the Egyptian army is absolutely infiltrated. It's controlled by the Muslim Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I didn't know that because Sisi launched a purge of the Muslim Brotherhood, right? After Morsi. So how come Sisi is in charge of an army that is, that is overrepresented, to say the least, by the Muslim Brotherhood. And the audio officer said, hey, look, the, you know, this, it, it happened uh, before Morsi went. He did this and they were never purged. And so they've kind of, you know, and, and he said, look what the, uh, number one, number two, he said, look what the Egyptian, and I, this isn't my view, I'm quoting him, look what the, the Egyptian military, what the, uh, the, the percentage of the defense budget that they are spending, I mean, defense of their GDP, they're spending on defense. And I forget the percentage, but it is high. Mm -hmm. And it, their, their defense budget is extraordinary. I looked it up. I mean, um, and, and of course, you know, Egypt, I believe, is the biggest recipient of USA, one of the biggest recipients, used to be one of the biggest recipients. Of, did I qualify that enough um, in the Middle East? It, it used to, at one point, it was, you know, right after Israel. I, I haven't checked to see. If not, I know that CC's regime there has has muddled things a bit but the point is what his point was he said who who's egypt's enemy you know i mean rhetorical question right i mean egypt doesn't have any readily apparent external enemies so why is egypt building up this extraordinary army that's going to be one of the most powerful in the middle east right and controlled by muslim brotherhood officers and uh he said so we we, you know, he said, we used to have a really good relationship with the Egyptian military. Um, they coordinated. They they even did combined strikes together um, in the Sinai, not, not mm. commonly known. Um, and, and of course, people challenged me on that. And if the Israel, neither the Israelis or the Egyptians want to tell people about that, because can you imagine if they're, you know, in, in Egypt, if they found out that their own officers were conducting strikes in coordination with the Israelis against... Mm. Um, extremists in the Sinai. When I say, I mean, I'm not saying Israelis can have the strike. I'm saying sharing of intelligence, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't play um, well on Main Street in Egypt. No, not on the Arab Street. Right. But, yeah. And so uh, you can see how tenuous Sisi's position is, right? You know, the, the Western world hates him. Um, he's got a military that apparently is is riddled with with uh, an internal organization that he has purged. He thinks he has purged from all office positions and has imprisoned all their leadership, except for mm -hmm. ones who work for him now in, in the army. All right. What do you think? He's a very, very tenuous position. What do typically do despots do when they are facing trouble internally? Crack down or start something externally. Yeah. Well, I mean, they do both. Yeah. yeah. They, yeah. And, and, and what's the most unpopular country in the world, probably right now, probably more so than Russia? Israel. Israel. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it look cool to the most of the world if Egypt stood up to Israel or threatened mm -hmm. or, or posed a military threat, even if it's just, even if it's just chest bang? I'm not suggesting, although. The IDF officer was suggesting it's a possibility that there would be another major war. Think about it. Lebanese Hezbollah in the north, Egyptians mm -hmm. in the south, and Iran. 
that that is potentially problematic um is this fantasy i don't know but stuff happens geopolitically that months before would have appeared fantasy yeah. the hamas attack right we we had to pinch ourselves uh the israelis you, you know it was so unexpected obviously so i i don't i'm not quick to dismiss this i don't think it's entirely paranoia and when i think about these questions i can't answer them except by saying yeah to as you know to build up a, a force that potentially potentially uh would be a counterweight to to israel so, so hey i'm sorry go ahead go ahead no i was gonna say along those lines then uh of of fantasy and you know not being able to picture something and then it happening is it possible that uh israel could that or specifically netanyahu could entertain a ceasefire in gaza in order to pivot and focus on hezbollah and any yeah. other external threat maybe use that you know say hey we're we're only entertaining this ceasefire or we're going to do a ceasefire because now this is the more existential threat yeah absolutely jason so you know netanyahu is a wily customer i mean he is he's he's been no one stays no one stays influential in Israeli politics as long as he has without knowing how to ring the bells and climb the ropes, right? Um, so I, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. He is, you know, he's got to, he's got to do two things. Well, he's got to do a number of things, but probably priority uh, is is to some is, is to close that potential air gap with the far right because political survival is ultimately important he knows that if he's tossed from power he faces criminal charges yes. some of you you know rem remember um for corruption and um and those and as long as he's been because of the uh, israeli constitution as long as he remains prime minister they can't triumph right so so mm -hmm. there is his freedom potentially is at stake do you think that he values anyone else's mm -hmm. rhetoric question right yeah you know who this reminds me of a little bit I'm not going to say, but there's another despot, um, very similar in, in mentality. If I, anyway, so so he's got to close that gap with the far right, and that's why they're adamant they're going to go into into Rafa, right? Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, what he wants to do is tell the far right, hey, listen, uh, we've we've been out of combat for six months. Um, our units are worn down. We've already sent the reservists back home, so it means that our active duty guys, uh, you know, that's only twenty percent of the entire force. Are, are you know they're they're fighting nonstop, and if you look at the units that have actually been fighting, um, it's a very small group. And and you know there's the commando brigade. There's a, I I don't want to go through them all because I'll be accused mm -hmm. of of it. But the point is they put their very best troops uh, in in the initial thing to clear. You know they'll saturate an area with firepower, and then they'll send in drones and surveillance, blah blah blah, and then they'll move in. Um, reconnaissance by fire direct direct fire reconnaissance by fire because they will argue hey we've told the civilians to evacuate every building every building gets a tank main gun round or a you know i mean enormous amount of ammunition that we mm -hmm. would have just dreamed of in fallujah um and then they'll send in their special uh special forces or one of their elite units uh like for instance i mean it it could be like say it Makar, uh or uh Igaz um, or Mektar, one of the one of the you know the really top ones, um, or it could just be you know a green side reconnaissance unit like um, the Galani Brigade reconnaissance unit. But they'll move in and they will seize kind of a bridgehead, a lodgement, and then what happens? And they I, I forget the term they use is a Hebrew term. It's a kind of a it, it's a hasty fob. They'll bring in D nines. They'll push up. Um, barriers around and they do it very quickly right a d9 is a workhorse in the campaign and then what they'll do is they'll bring in what's a d9 it's a it's a giant armored bulldozer it is uh, i mean it is dominating it's dominating um the battlefield i know that sounds crazy but it is you know I, it, these soldiers are saying hey it's easily it's it's more useful than a tank because it can, you know, it can do so many things. Anyway, um, so they'll push up, they'll make this uh, this hasty fob, they'll bring in conventional, and they'll just drive in conventional forces and trucks, right? There's no, 
and and they'll get out, you know, they'll they'll bivy and they'll um, and then they'll start to move into buildings, all right, that have already been cleared, and they and then the process repeats itself. So all of that will take like two weeks for one. You know, I'm I, I, I'm just saying it's slow, very very slow because they want to avoid IDF casualties. IDF casualties are very low. If you look, they're in the five, you know, mid five hundreds. Uh, but but most uh, but um, more more than half of those were killed on seven October. So it, and I I'm not up to date on the latest, but last I checked, it was like two sixty. Yeah, two sixty um, something. Yeah, KIA in six months of urban fighting. Shit. I mean, we fighting in in Fallujah. I mean, you can look up, you can you can compare it. We, but the bottom line is, when you when you compare per capita, uh, you know, the number of people involved, blah 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 blah. Of course, you can't include all the variables. Uh, but our casualties were at least three times IDF casualties, uh, three times in Fallujah, and we were fighting. Let's face it, Al Qaeda in Iraq. Um, who, you know, I'm not saying they were like elite, but they were certainly better than Hamas. Mm -hmm. certainly better and and they were fighting to the death which um hamas is not necessary they're doing hit and run raids so and and so the the resistance they're meeting is not like a dug in defense and depth and blah blah you know kill zones mm -hmm. it is two or three gunmen um hit and run uh rpg shots grenades tossed out of windows so how um, can they say that they've killed nine thousand fucking hamas guys well that's really interesting well i mean easily it, that could, of course, that could easily have happened because they've killed 33,000 people in the, Sure. You know, so, but, but remember we had this discussion. Yeah, every, week, every right? military yeah, age yeah. male is like, oh, that's a mosque. Yeah, if you count every single military age male who was killed, which I've, you know, I've heard units do uh, as Hamas, remember, this is kind of a flashback to Vietnam, yeah. uh, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if he's, yeah. if he's uh, Vietnamese and dead, he's VC. Oh um, yeah, I'm. I'm not saying that that's what they're doing, but look at the math. You know, nine thousand military age males killed in the bombardment, and the Israelis are saying nine thousand mass fighters killed. They were saying more than that, um, thirteen, fourteen thousand. Then someone pointed out math. You know, the math, and okay. hey, are they are they recruiting a lot of women? You know, um, but that is bad news for the Israelis because even if every single one of those guys was a card carrying Hamas killer. That still leaves that still leaves significantly more than the four battalions the Israelis say remain behind. Okay, yeah. so estimates. Remember, at the beginning of the war, and the Israelis were saying, "Hey, this is going to be cataclysmic. We're going to go it because we have to because there are twenty-five to thirty thousand Hamas fighters waiting for us in there." So, if you lose use even their lowest estimate, twenty-five thousand, you've removed nine. D, go for it. How many is that? Carry the one. Yeah, that's 16,000. Yeah. That's a lot more than four battalions, isn't it? Yeah. Where did these guys go? Because the Israelis have sealed the area. Could they be in the tunnels? Yeah, probably. You know, so right. there, there is a significant, there are significant problems. We talked about this before the Israelis even went in. You know, they, you just cannot eviscerate Hamas this way. You can talk about it. You can say you've done right. it. Did we do that in Fallujah? No, oh. we didn't. That whole fucking battle was a waste of time. Aside from the fact what happened to Iraq later. But I mean, even operationally, it turned out that battle was a waste of time. We didn't get Zakawi. You know, we got a bunch of, we got thousands of dudes, Yemenis, Saudis, foreign Syrians who came there to die and fight to the death. And they gave us a very difficult time. But the losses were probably more important to us than they were to them. Yeah. All right, so, so what happens uh, in the next week or two with Iran responding? Yeah, is it going to be strictly through proxies? They're not going to be shooting rockets uh, or missiles mm, from their own? Well, they've got no reason to shoot them. You know, I mean, they, first of all, they've got, I mean, they, it, it, once they start firing from their own soil, the whole game changes. Hey, by the way, right. so the game, remember we talked about the game, both the Israelis and the Iranians and Hezbollah play by rules of the game. All right. Mm -hmm. So you whack me this way, I can whack you that way, and I will. And and everything stays cool. You know, and it starts off lower level. Anything that happens in Sheba Farms up in uh Golan Heights stays in Sheba Farms. Right. So when you know the Israelis and, and Hezbollah go at it there, it's like, hey, this is contained. It's you know, it's just we're just 
which is kind of not fun, but you know. Yeah. But then when Iran, I mean, Hezbollah strikes into Israel, now Israel strikes, you know, and and the policy is, hey, if we inflict civilian casualties, we inflict civilian casualties, we're going after these targets, blah, blah, blah. So, but there's a, but with Iran, the the rule is this, okay, we can kill each other outside our home countries, all right? So, you know, if a Mossad agent gets whacked by Iranians in Paris, um, no one It's knows. just part of the but game. Then, right. It's part of the game. Um, there are exceptions to that, you know, attacks on embassies and things like that. I feel like that's a bit of a, a, bit of a <laughs> which we've, push. Uh, yeah, which the Israelis may have. So this is the point. So the Israelis are arguing, hey, man, I mean, these are, they're not saying, hey, man, to Khomeini. They're, they're talking among themselves. If you look, you know, the, the experts, um, hey, we play by the rules of the game. These are three Kuz Force officers, but it was in Damascus. Mm. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was next to an embassy, but it wasn't really the embassy. Come on, guys. You know, but Khomeini's saying, no, absolutely not in Hebrew in his text. And he's saying that was part of our embassy. And now you fuckers are going to catch some. Um, what is that going to mean? Uh, well, I, you know, certainly from Hezbollah, direct, uh, direct drone, uh, missile attacks, rockets, um, as I said, combined with the Houthis. But I think, you know, cyber attacks, although the Israelis are very good there, I think what the Israelis are most concerned about are, are um, asymmetric overseas attacks against their own embassies. That's what I was going right? to say. That would be perfectly symmetric. Yeah. But, he's, you know, but, it, but the point is that that is what they're most concerned about. An El Al airliner shot down by yeah. a surface-to-air missile. Yep. That's not going to be that difficult to do, no. right? I mean, they don't carry any, I don't know, but I mean, <laughs> you know, shooting down a commercial airliner uh, with a service to air missile is a little like seal hunting. Mm -hmm. um, not, uh, not our friends, the seals, but the, the, the swimming one. Oh, shit. The, <laughs> the, 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 one, the animal, the fucking mammals. Yeah. Oh, I, I still haven't narrowed it down. Yeah, no. <laughs> now, what okay. about, um, do you think that would extend uh, to us, to the U.S.? You know, they, um, yeah, yeah, we're, we're, they I mean, uh, Khomeini said we're, we're in the crosshairs for having provided us. You look, I'm not, I'm not really scared from the Iranians and, and that, you know, that Iran was, Iran was a special interest of mine. <laughs> it was a hobby, uh, not a hobby, but it was a, <laughs> it was a forced area of interest of mine when I was wearing a uniform. Um, so I'm not, you know, I'm not saying, hey, we need to make, uh, they, they are irreconcilable. This this regime is hell-bent on, uh, on on constantly finding weaknesses and causing both us and other Western nations in Israel pain. Um, it's a very, very bad administration. But on the other hand, on the other hand, um, the concern, I think, in the U.S. administration is that this, I don't know how much coordination took place beforehand. Um I hope a good deal of coordination took place. I hope that the U.S. was was warned in time to take mitigation measures for its own troops and its own assets and its own infrastructure. And I would say if we were not, that would be certainly a, a cause for massive complaint. But because we haven't been complaining about it and there's no I haven't seen any criticism from the U.S. administration, I, I'm pretty sure that the U.S. Uh, at least knew about this. I don't know. I don't know at all. Well, I mean, okay. from the like the DOD's press people, they're saying that they didn't. Oh, oh, they are okay. I'm sorry, I'm behind on that. But I mean, um, that's probably what they say, right? Yeah, n n yeah, it could be. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, my biggest concern is like blowback on U.S. interests in the area more than press like, people allowed to lie. I don't think that spokesmen are not allowed to lie. Oh, I mean, like maybe they weren't told themselves, so they're like, oh, I have no idea. I think like they keep them in the dark on purpose, so they yeah, don't lie. I mean, they don't technically lie. That's but a they, really but interesting they have said point. That they had no Lying idea, or or not telling your own PAO what's yeah. going on. Also, like, um, shit. No, forget it. I totally forgot. My, you know what? My PAO would certainly related to that. You sure you didn't tell me you canceled the key volunteer meeting? <laughs> I showed up at my phone anyway. I digress, but that's a really interesting point. Yeah, I don't know, but it, it's certainly yeah we we are we are in the crosshairs and we are more vulnerable in some ways than Israel because we have forces 
overseas that Israel does not. Um, and Israel's military, at least, and civilian infrastructure, yes, Iron Dome will be overwhelmed, um, but at least they are, you know, they, there's there's some protection measure in place. There are for our troops overseas, but they, um, it's, you know, arguable whether they are as robust. Now, look, I, I get it. Well, our true, you know, our bases are widely dispersed. Israel is, is compacted all together. Israel's civilians, infrastructure. Um, that was silly of me to say that our troops are more vulnerable, blah, 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 blah. But we are vulnerable. Of course we are. Honestly, and I'd not, be more... And, and the, strike, I, the strike against us probably is not going to come in the next three months. Yeah. It's and and honestly, I'd be, I'd Remember, be more... Jason, what uh, saying? I'd be more... My, me personally, I'd be more uh, worried about troops or, or uh, being hit outside of the Middle Eastern AOR. Yeah. You know, like a la the uh, discotheque in Germany with Libya, you know, that sort of thing. Somewhere where we just would never, not that we wouldn't expect it, you know, everybody would be on alert, but um, where, you know, to borrow from you, just a little bit more vulnerable, you know, uh, where our, our, it's, we're not as heightened. You know, I don't see one here in the U.S. within our borders. I mean, anything is possible, probably more like a lone wolf in the name of kind of yeah. thing, but um that's where I'd be more worried is that, you know, Iran via proxy would uh, hit us somewhere else, you know, Japan or Korea or something like that, you know, outside of the Middle East, the Middle Eastern AOR, because that's where our, our eyes are focused. So, you know, that's just me personally. Yeah. And, and as you guys know, Hezbollah really does have global reach because mm -hmm. the Lebanese diaspora is everywhere and they're, and they're normally absolutely very successful wherever they go. Um, you know, I've been in uh, Liberia, you know, and the, yeah. the, the, the Lebanese are running, I wouldn't say running what they were back then, running, I mean, everything um, during a very shitty time, right? You know, the aftermath of the civil war. Um, but just as an example, I remember the attack, the attempted attack in Thailand. Um, and that was actually two course for us guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it was several years ago. You remember it was foiled, yes. uh, but they, um, so that, yeah, they, they're certainly capable of doing that. And it makes sense because we are less prepared there. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good point. Um, so what happens, else. let's say they hit some, something in Europe or wherever in Asia. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, a handful of Americans are killed. What happens? Do we trace it back to Iran and make a public, uh, outcry of it and start fucking smoking Iran? Like what's, what's yeah, the move I, after that? So I, so I think, you know, Iran's too smart to hit directly. It'll be via proxies. Um, and and that's kind of playing the game, right? Because we've never struck at Iran after, even when we've lost U.S. soldiers by Iranian proxy. So we have a history of not um, striking at Iran itself, even when that has happened. I mean, from the Iraq war, right? All the way through to recently. Now, when I said that something is coming, for us, uh, you know, I'm not being alarmist, but think about that. And it's not going to come in the next three months. So what year, when did we kill Khomeini? I mean, not Khomeini, Soleimani. Soleimani. January 2020, 21. right? Mm. Was it 2020? It was 2020. 2020. Oh, it was 2020. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we killed him then. And then we lose, you know, we lose three guys in Tower 22, four years away, right? And and the Iranians, not the Iranians, I'm sorry, Um but it, but in the aftermath of that, uh, in the on 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 Twitter at least, there's a lot of reference back to revenge for Soleimani. I'm not you know so so they waited you know four years. Yeah, I mean three. I'm not saying that that's that's the end of their revenge. Remember the captain of the Vin Vincennes. Do you remember that story? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the Vincennes. No. The, okay, the USS Vincennes, which is a U.S. Navy ship. Uh, shot down an Iranian Airbus in 1889. Okay, awful mistake. You know, some 1990, 1989. 1989. 1989. Yeah, <laughs> that that would really have made the news in 1989. Yeah, that'd be wild. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck's an Airbus? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, sorry, man. Um, where was I? Yeah, so we shot it down in 1989. Um, all passengers on board killed. Iran at the time said, hey, we, you know, that was not deliberate. We'll get back to you. I, I, it was supreme incompetence. You know, if you read the investigation on it, I mean, it, it was not the Navy's finest hour. 
and it had tragic consequences. But we kind of blew it off. And um, uh, I think it was 10 years later, just less, eight, year, eight, nine years later, the skipper of the Vincennes' wife walks out to a van, starts in, it blows up, um, very seriously injuring her. Uh, coincidence? You know, who knows? And he normally, it was his van. He normally drove it. She just that morning had, had driven out. Eight years, right? Eight yeah. years, San Diego, you know, he's out of the military. Yeah. They didn't forget. Yeah. So I would say their track record, I'm not eulogizing Iran, but their track record is certainly such that they will follow through. Yeah. And Khomeini painted himself into a corner. It's hard to envision any yeah. other way out. Yeah. There's something else I want to mention, guys. So while all of this is going on, tens of thousands of Israelis have been taking to the streets uh, to protest against yeah. Netanyahu's handling of the hostage part of this. Mm. You know, they they believe, all right, and I've spoken to them, um, that you know, several families of hostages, uh, and I'm just repeating facts again, they are universally filled with contempt for Netanyahu. They feel that the right wing and Netanyahu do not give a shit about their, you know, their hostages, their, their families. Um, they are shocked by the friendly fire incident, you know, where, where three hostages were killed. I, mm. If you're interested in reading exactly, exactly what happened there, it is a shocking story. Then please subscribe to my Substack because it is awesome. Um, and and so they they think that you know Netanyahu it's not going to be in his favor to halt have a ceasefire even if the hostages are released released because the right wing will tear him down for not just crushing um, Rafa okay and and part of the hostage deal will probably involve not going into Rafa you know right now Hamas is saying no we want all Israeli forces out of Gaza okay. Um, that's obviously going to be a no-go for the Israelis. But the point, you know, I mean, it's negotiation back and and forth. But Netanyahu's uh, right-wingers are saying, no, there's fucking no negotiation. You've got to go in and crush Rafa, anything less than that, and we are ditching you. Um, tens of thousands of Israelis, as I say, protesting against him. So you just could not have a more complex severe <laughs> Well, it's going to get more complex. But it's, yeah. there's a lot of shit going on, D in that part of the world right now, which is why I'm going out there in an hour and a half. If, if you will let me, um, my other thing, uh, the hostage deal, like the hostage negotiations, like the most recent, there was a, they said that like, they were trying to get 40 hostages that met a certain criteria that were like middle age, uh, military age males. And that Hamas didn't have access to enough of them because the re majority of them have died who are like women, children, elderly, and are, are males with like sicknesses. Uh, is that like them bullshitting? Is like what it, or is that the truth? Like they are like, yeah, they're all dead and we only have X amount. Uh, oh, Hamas is saying that? Yeah. They're saying they have how many? They, so the deal was we want 40 yeah, yeah. for the ceasefire, oh, oh, right. but they only yeah. meet a certain criteria, like women, yeah. children, elderly. Okay. And, and they're then, saying they don't have enough to meet that criteria. Yeah, yeah. so we need to like okay. add. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a horribly painful topic, isn't it? But I think, you know, the IDF estimates that a third of at least a third of the remaining hostages are dead already. I don't know how they do that, um, how they estimate that. But that's, you know, that's from their estimation. I. I think, you know, obviously how many are left are probably gathered in tunnel system around Sinwa. I mean, he, he is bound to be surrounded by hostages because if the Israelis get him, he's going to want to die with Israelis, right? He's going to want, I mean, he doesn't, he doesn't want his death to be cheap. So he's going to surround himself with those hostages and they're going to want to hold on to those particular hostages. And he's still buried down there. And not only is he down there, but he is communicating. No one knows how the fuck he is communicating, but he's communicating to Qatar, Qatar, as is, but for Americans, Qatar, <laughs> um, where the negotiations are taking place. So this is what's happening. In the negotiating room are, you know, the Qataris, uh, Burns, you know, head of the CIA. Right, uh, Jason, he's in there, I believe. Actually, yeah. he's actually in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and... Uh, 
Well, maybe he isn't. Maybe he isn't the one. No, I'm he sorry. He was there he's this not. week. He, he was, was there. He, he yeah. was he's there in Qatar, but he's not in the room with the Hamas yeah. uh, negotiators. The guys in the room are the Egyptians, the Qataris, uh, and I forget who else. And so what happens is you've got them there. You've got a uh, U.S. delegation and you've got the Israeli delegation. Um, the negotiation takes place in the, in the Hamas room, and then the Qataris relay the the latest offer to the Israelis, you know, with the U.S. in in attendance, um, and then the and obviously then you know the Israelis go back and blah blah. But what's really interesting? What happens on the Hamas side, right? Because Hamas comes back with answers. They are very hierarchical, so they haven't empowered their negotiators to make deals without referring back to one guy, Sinwa, who's in the tunnels. So you can see why this is kind of slow. So. The Israelis will make an offer. Let's say Hamas will go, okay, uh, you know, these uh, Zionist pig dogs, we will, you know, we will go and discuss uh, discuss this before we butcher them, you know, whatever. The negotiators go out and they contact Sinwa. I fucking no clue how. I mean, they don't have time to get a guy on a plane. And even if they did, how does he get into Gaza? So they are communicating electronically so how how are we not in on that how is an israel i don't know like, got the I don't drop know. On how that? how do we have the most sophisticated communication uh, two two of the world's most sophisticated communicate um uh, electronic warfare <laughs> nations what are these fucking balloons going off yeah right? when you um, do motions like you have your ah oh, <laughs> wow that is awesome man okay it's keyword um, where was i it's just totally when you have oh, the yeah. two so most... the negotiations. So, so you've got the United States and Israel, literally world class signals intelligence. You know the best. And how 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 does this happen? I don't know, Jason. What do what are your thoughts? How could it be? Happening? Well, I was just thinking about. I mean, could it be that we are privy to it and we do know, but we're allowing it because because of the ramifications of okay, we know where he is. We can pinpoint on it. But like you said, if he's surrounded by hostages or taking him off the board, maybe it escalates things. So maybe you know, we're allowing it. Or that is a really interesting point. I didn't think about that. So in other words, the Israelis can pinpoint him, mm -hmm. but they know they suspect he's surrounded by hostages yep. and they don't, but they don't want to announce it domestically or to the IDF that they know no. where he is because then, you know, it, it's really interesting. Yeah, they got to know. I mean, at least like the U.S. has to know. I, I wouldn't be surprised if like the U.K. knows what's going on. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I mean, there's only one guy who can really answer this, and that's <clears throat> Sinwa. And um, hopefully he's watching down there in the tunnel with his electronic suite. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll hear from him. Wouldn't that be good? I mean, I'm not making fun of him. He's a fucking mess. You know, he, he is a terrorist. And uh, actually, we wouldn't we wouldn't feel this call, would we, D? Um, but... I would, yeah, I would bad, love bad to joke. Talk Please to don't him. complain about that one. Yeah, I would love um, to talk to him. I talked to BB and I call them both fucking jerk offs. Yeah, well, that's probably why he doesn't call us, D. Yeah, Sorry. I mean, it's one thing getting Sensor. hunted down by the IDF, it's quite another when D calls you a jerk off. <laughs> you know, you know, we've reached you in that deer. Yeah, uh, is there a possibility it. that the US is like telling Israel, like, all right, we know where he's at exactly in the tunnels and stuff, but he's got 30 or so hostages around him. Uh, protecting him basically you can't hit him uh with like a fucking bunker buster because we're trying you know maybe the u.s is reigning israel back and back channels and stuff like that obviously yeah. really not publicly um yeah there's a lot going on that uh behind the scenes obviously to use that dreadful cliche but it's it's fascinating and and uh and what jason just said has been really thinking about yeah i mean it's byzantine and then with on the Israeli side, who knows, who doesn't know? Does mm -hmm. the IDF know? You know, I mean, because if Netanyahu knows that, you know, they know, he knows shit. He knows where Sinma is. Does the whole cabinet know? And if the whole cabinet knows, why aren't the right wingers pushing just screaming? Yeah. yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's very Watching interesting. their pearls. You couldn't, out. you couldn't, yeah. you couldn't make a uh, streaming TV show that was, yeah. I mean, more more enthralling than this. Yeah. yeah. It's quite something. I think I know we're winding down. Yeah, um, so we got a question uh, from uh from one of the people that watched the show, I guess, the fans. 
uh, because you mentioned about being detained by uh, Iran when you were a younger man, and uh, they want to know what that story was like and what, like expand on it a bit. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, so lo long, long time ago, um, nineteen eighty seven specifically, which dates me, uh, which I'm not a worried about. Um, I I was I had too brilliant. I <laughs> thank you. I had the brilliant idea that I wanted to travel to Australia overland from the United Kingdom. Um, do you, if you look at a map, yes, you'll notice that there are water. And when I say overland, I don't literally mean, but I meant as far as I can overland. All right. Um, I, you know, I just, uh, I just failed an exam at law school and I had to take a whole year and retake four because I failed that one. That's just the way law school was. So I thought I'd put it to good use. And I had a girlfriend at the time who had just inconveniently moved to Australia and had said, Hey, come on out. You so like I'll walk there. No. Um, so the plan was, okay. I couldn't drive. Uh, I wasn't allowed to drive from my own rules, um, local transport or, or just catching rides. So it was all bus train, local ground transportation i could fly you know anyway that was the plan it didn't, it, and and it worked out but it, with a few hiccups along the way so i got so the big deal was getting through iran uh, this was 1987 um in i think it was in august uh, or the previous year right 86 uh, the the us had struck libya okay um iran was rallied behind Gaddafi at the time, the U.S. struck Libya and uh, and the uh, F-111s took off from the United Kingdom. So the U.K. and the U.S. were in uh, Iran's bad books, and it had been anyway, um, and it was impossible to get a visa anyway. I, I turned out that a college alumni, I went to University College London, college alumni was an Iranian, not only an Iranian, but was uh, headed up the um, the visa section at the Iranian embassy. And uh, I heard that, you know, so I was referred to him. He's he's popping up. He pops up in the alumni. <laughs> to see, you know, Ravi, you know, I was like, cool. So I got an introduction from one of his former professors. And uh, and he said, OK, come around, you know, and he was very, yeah, he's, I mean, he was very uh, amicable and everything. He said, look, you know, I, he goes, why do you want to go to Iran? And I went, I, I want to visit my girlfriend in Australia. And I thought that he goes, just stop it's <laughs> just give me a good reason and uh i said well I'm, he goes what are you doing at college i said philosophy he's like jesus christ and i said what well, part of that he didn't say jesus christ you know <laughs> just, yeah. i said hey part of that's theology he's like now you're talking all right let's do this i mean the conversation was literally like this he was very western he goes so we'll say you're a theology student you want to you know um not study islam but you're very interested in the you know the, the shia religions not its birthplace but kind of it's it's uh it's bastion um so i did so, and uh he gave me a visa handwritten i still got it handwritten in my british passport i sent my us one ahead because i thought british would be a better bet well it had to be because it's where my fucking visa was handwritten you know he didn't have a they gave so few visas and he signed it um and so off I went, um, and and I wanted to skip Europe, Europe's boring. So I flew to Turkey and uh, got on the local bus, got to the Iranian border, and that's when things started to go amiss, oddly enough. And um, so I'm waiting there for three days on the Iranian border to get across. They're just processing everyone. And when I say processing, they really are just emptying everything. Well, I'm on this rickety, you know, rickety bus. I'm sitting there with the chickens and the hens by the bus for three days, you know, my sleeping bag and you know, there's food vendors. It's not too bad until there's a truck ahead of us. And we're finally going and they, the, um, on the Iranian side. So the Turks, no problem on the Iranian side, they're searching this guy's truck. I didn't see this happen, but apparently they found heroin. You guys swear this is true. Um, again, I didn't see it. This is what the passengers told me later. What I did see was them dragging this dude out and shooting him just fucking shooting him dead Ooh. and and i'm i'm like oh what i said and i said was he turkish was he and they they were like uh don't know doesn't matter <laughs> you know it was I, I, he must have been iranian because they wouldn't have shot a turk right in front of the turkish border guards but it was just you know and that that kind of made me think don't worry i'm getting to it to the point here so 
I wanted to get out of it, but it was too late to turn back. And I've already told my friends, right? You know, I mean, it's the egos. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 20, you know, two years old. I, I can't go back. So I just think, fuck, I'll go for, you know, go on and, and execute the trip. And I had two weeks to get across Iran by terms of my visa. So I had a, a route plotted where I went to um, Tehran, uh, Qom, Shiraz, Isfahan, and then a shithole town on the Pakistan border, Zahidan. So I get to Tehran. It's early hours of the morning. Uh, this is November. I want to say November 1987. The date's significant. Okay. I get, I, uh, and, and there are, you know, I'm the only whitey on the bus, right? <laughs> so I'm like, and I've got, do you remember Walkmans? I had a Walkman, <laughs> orange Walkman, ACDC. I'm out. I'm not that bright. <laughs> um so not exactly out, blending in jeans you know it's cold so i'm wearing you know jeans ski jacket i get off and uh there's a welcoming committee and um it's like guys who, who they're revolutionary guard they it, it wasn't called igrc back then we they were just called the revolutionary guard and they were clearly identifiable in fact i've got <laughs> one of their cat badges and i can't remember how i got it um but i spent uh, they had a Filipino uh, woman there with her, probably in her 20s. Uh, she was a domestic help, and she she was there as a translator. And they they took me off to this hangar. It's really cold, I remember. Um, and they questioned me all night. Never, They didn't lay a finger on me. Um, they threatened me, but they never... Um, at one point, you know, they they pick up my Walkman and one of them puts it on and it's cranked up and back in black. <laughs> so the last thing out of his ears. <laughs> and he takes it off and he just fucking throws it against the wall. And then they're just breaking all my, do you remember cassette tapes? They're yeah. just breaking them. You know, ACDC did it for them. They're just going. <laughs> and I start laughing. I mean, it's surreal. <laughs> like, and the Filipino girl looks at me and she goes, stop laughing. I went, uh, and she goes, you, you can disappear. We can both disappear here and no one gives a shit. No one, she didn't say give a shit. No one cares. There's no U.S. embassy. No, I'm, she doesn't say that to me. I'm thinking, yeah, there's no U.S. embassy here. You know, and so that, that and I could tell she was, I mean, she was so scared. She was shaking and, and that really, that really woke me up. Well, mm -hmm. what saved me was my passport. <laughs> that, that pathetic handwritten visa Mm -hmm. um the fact that this guy had signed his name apparently made it a, a big deal i don't know if it, you know they they wouldn't have known of him but it was a big deal so they you know they brought in i guess uh an officer who did speak some english and he said hey you you have to um you should leave iran as quickly as possible i said yeah but i can stay here two weeks you know i told you i wasn't too fucking oh, like. shit. <laughs> and uh 22 said, year I, old punk bro yeah but I he goes weeks, guys he goes <laughs> I'm just telling you, you, you need to, you need to get out. And I said, okay, can I report, can I coordinate a trip, like not a trip, but coordinate, I just tell you where I'm going. So I, this doesn't happen again. And so I did, you know, I mapped it out. Can you believe that? I'm mapping out my, my itinerary for the revolutionary guard. By the way, that was the last time I did that. <laughs> and, um, uh, I promise you this is true. So I get on a, you know, they let me go. Um, I get all my stuff up. Uh, they even let they even let me keep one uh, ACDC tape and uh, and oddly enough a Michael Jackson tape that wasn't mine. I had no idea how the fuck I got it, but I ended up with that one and came to be a fan of Michael Jackson as a result. Um, and and so I go to this town called Shiraz, which is of course is famous. It's uh, uh, there's a shrine there to um, Imam Ali, but it was a staging point for the Iraq War. Remember the Iraq War was it was uh, raging. Um, in, in Shiraz and probably for that reason in Shiraz, I get arrested again, this time by the MPs. Okay. And, um, I, I'm out. Oh, you're going to think I'm so fucking stupid. I'm running. <laughs> okay. So I'm going for a run and, uh, and my, you know, I can't wear shorts, obviously I'm wearing sweats and I thought, yeah, but no one fucking jogs in revolutionary Iran and especially not with a camera strapped to their waist. Oh, um, <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ, thing. Andy. A Western camera. I'm yeah. sorry. I got to tell you the truth. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's this Jeep driving by me and I get inv invited to join the MPs in the back and they take me back to, and they lock me in a cell this time. And they come in and question me again. No one's, 
no one's threatening me, but this time that, um, you know, they, it's, they're like, they're hinting darkly that they're going to have to turn me over to someone. And, uh, so I'm, I'm there overnight. They, it wasn't bad. It, um, in fact, the, one of the Iranians came and brought me grapes, gave them through the bars, which was, you know, I mean, they, they the soldiers were, were really cool to me. Mm -hmm. it was, it was, um, the, the revolutionary guard were not, but the soldiers were actually pretty friendly. And then their lieutenant came in and he, I'm not lying, had been to London University. See the link here? A lot of Iranians went to London University. So he spoke fluent English and very kind of English, uh, Ang uh, an Anglophile, obviously. And he's like, hey, uh, mate, he did call me mate. He said, mate, you need to, he goes, look, I have done everything I can, but I've, I, had to re I have to report you to Revolutionary Guard. Um, and uh and you're probably, and you're gonna have to go back to Tehran again for more questioning. I'm like, fuck. Um and he said, Yeah, we'll have you know someone to pick you up. They're sending someone down to pick you up. I'll be here in about, you know, I forget, you know, six hours. So I'm sitting there just thinking, fuck man. But about three hours later, uh the they come back, the officer comes back and he's got all my stuff, all right, um, to include the ACDC tape and uh and and now Michael Jackson and my passport and my money and i'm just wow and he said hey we called tehran and they said they already checked you out basically you're good to go so i'd had the the revolutionary guard stamp of approval yeah he's a theology student that's why he's in shiraz and uh the guy's like if they're good i'm good but get the fuck out of iran <laughs> yeah said, the second yeah. time <laughs> hey listen i've got a visa though it allows me to spend two weeks so i get i understand what you're telling me man but such <laughs> ways and I said, okay, look, I've already cleared my route. I'm going to go to Qom next. Okay, this part of next part of the story, you are not going to believe, but it's absolutely true. So I can't remember where it was, but it was in route to Qom. Um, we stop at a at a some shithole town. And um I I go for shit uh, as as I was, you know, it's very good at that. And I was doing it a lot and getting a lot of practice. And <laughs> some someone must have mentioned that I was not Iranian. You know, maybe they noticed. <laughs> uh, thing I know someone's throwing a, uh, someone throws a rock off the, it's a corrugated iron shitter and someone throws, bounces a rock off and then they're all just throwing shit. So here I am, now I'm dropping another load, right? I mean, I'm just like, oh, damn, <laughs> I'm going to die in a shitter and no one's going to know. Um, and, and then, you know, eventually, um, you know, it kind of dies down and then there's a knock on the door <laughs> and uh, I'm thinking, fuck man, I hope the bus hasn't left. Well, it's the, it's soldiers, Iranian soldiers. They say, hey, we'll, we'll walk you through the crowd. They're a little pissed off right now. Um, I said, thank you. You know, so they walk me back to the bus and they go, hey, uh, one of them speaks English and he's like, hey, you've got about an hour. Do you want to go and see the monument? And I'm like, yeah, let's just get the fuck out of here. And we're on our way. And he goes, I said, what's the monument? And he said, yeah, the Americans sent uh, sent uh, people here, blah, blah, you know, to try and rescue their hostages. And oh, shit. we, we might destroyed have them me. all. And this is, and and so no shit. Yeah. There's a wreckage of a CH-53. Um, I can't tell you where it was on the map. It had been moved. It had the flight helmet um, on top. Um, and I know it's a CH-53 because I took a photo. And then mm. subsequently, when I recognized what a CH-53 was, <laughs> and there was a, uh, there was um, other wreckage, but I, you know, I, at the time I couldn't identify what it was, but there, and there was us, there was at least one us uh, flight. I'm going to say it was flight helmet mm -hmm. on, on top of that. Um, and a little blurb explaining what had happened. And of course the soldiers wanted to explain to me what had happened. I pretended I didn't know. I'm like, wow. wow. But I was, you know, it was one shock after another and I wasn't done yet. Um, I get to Isfahan, beautiful city, by the way. If you ever get a chance to go to Isfahan, don't, but not because it isn't beautiful. <laughs> if you work that one out. Um, absolutely lovely. I stayed in a five-star hotel with my black dollar, my black market dollars for like $3 a night. Yeah. I, mm. oh. Anyway, um, mm -hmm. but I but in the morning, there's a there's frantic knocking on my door. Mm. <clears throat> the only guests in the hotel so not hard to find and uh it's it's the manager and he's like we tried to get you up last night and no one could we were yelling and we had to move, we had to rush out and i'm like okay why why do you have to rush out he goes what you didn't hear the iranians hit 
the city, they, you know, they, they bombed, he said bombed. Um, the Iranians did use long range bombers. I, did, I mean, sorry, the Iraqis bombed mm. the city. Yeah. I, I don't know that they used long range bombers. They certainly used missiles. Mm. Um, and I know that they did use long range bombers during the War of the Cities. This yeah. is one of the uh, five big strikes during the War of the Cities, which is the term that was subsequently used to, to um, describe the bombing campaign between Iran and Iraq. And this was a major one. And they had flattened areas of this one. I don't know how I slipped through it because it wasn't that far away. Mm. Um, they they tracked a, a whole neighborhood with Scud missiles. Um, I saw it because as we drove out, we went through this area. I'm like, I, I mean, I was just so tired. I think the stress and everything, you know, I was just out. But I'm heading now. I'm I'm heading for Pakistan. Don't I'm almost done. I'm heading for Pakistan. Oh, this is great. And and I arrive in this another shit old town, Zahidan. Look it up on the map. I, I'm sure it hasn't changed that much. Zahidan is packed. It, it's like if you look where it is on the map, you can imagine what the atmosphere is there. They've got Baluchis, they've got Afghans, they've got Iranians, they you name it. And and they're all pissed off and angry. You know, the 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 war, uh, the Russians are still in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So you've got all that bubbling away, not far away. And so Zahidan is not a place you want to hang out. It is, it is a frontier town in the worst possible, worst possible term. And the last thing you want to put into that town is a 22-year-old Brit, you know, uh, very clearly with his ACDC tape. <laughs> and and I, I was threatened almost as soon as I got off the bus. Um, and, and it was pretty, you know, I wouldn't say it was mob, but it was a group um, yelling insults at me and following me. And um, and the group just grew, and so I've, I I headed for a police station, and I walked in, and there's two cops there, and there's an old Afghan with a Lee Enfield. Oh, Again, shit. I'm not making this up. Um, and and I explained to them what's happening, and they are concerned. You know, they're concerned for my safety. They call their boss, and uh, he goes, "Look, we don't have accommodation here, but you can sleep in a cell." And I said, you know, funny enough, to it. <laughs> that's the second time I've been offered that. Yeah. And and he said, you'll be safe here. You know, we'll just, uh, we'll leave the, um, but that's the only place. And I said, okay. And you can imagine the cell was not the most clean. Um, <laughs> I stretched out. I didn't even want to touch the mattress, man. It was oh, crawling man. with things. Um, you know, I had a bag. I stretched out on the floor. I had a, you know, I support mat. Um but I wasn't, you know, but the cop and the, you know, I couldn't sleep. And so I started chatting with the cop and the Afghan gentleman who was ancient. Well, he used to be in the British army or the British Indian army. Mm -hmm. It was hilarious. No, I mean, I said, well, he said, yeah, I was in, uh, oh, fuck, man. I can't remember. It would have been like the Pathan, uh, you know, the, the Kyber rifles or something. Yeah. Um, and he had his badge. Uh, yeah. It was, it, I mean, it, it was quite something. That's awesome. The next day, I I, I got out, um, I, and I'm finishing here because I know Jason needs to needs to go. Um, they they finally took my last cassette at the border. They broke my Walkman. <laughs> they made me walk. They I swear to God, I they made me walk across an American flag. They painted on the sidewalk. <laughs> Just, oh, uh, yeah. So forgive me for that. All right. Um, I wouldn't. Real, real I know quick, people I, I ask just... me. I, I need to ask this real quick before we go. When you, when all was said and done, were you debriefed by like yeah. intelligence services? And that's or? how, and that's how I ended up in the Marine Corps, Jason. In <laughs> Islamabad, I went into, so I went through all kinds of shit in Pakistan too. I, I got into, um, uh, I was in Balochistan during uh, fucking riots in the Pakistani shooting people. But I get to the embassy in Islamabad and I go in to get my passport because my mom has sent it. And um, I'm, I'm chatting to one of the consular officers and he's like, yeah, so where did you come from? And I said, uh, Iran. And he's like, <laughs> why? Oh. And I said, yeah, Iran. Yeah. Look, and, you know, I got my visa and everything. It was pretty cool. Shiraz was nice, but jail sucked, you know, and they got my ACDC tape and he's like, wait. And he calls, you know, Hey Bill, I need you to come up here. So I spent, he's like, yeah, I want you to talk to our, you know, chief consular officer. Yeah. He's just interested in, some of the dynamics in Iran. I'm like, oh, cool. And he goes, you can eat in the cafeteria afterwards, man. <laughs> so I spent all morning with these two guys asking fucking weird questions, you know, and they <laughs> seem <laughs> like, um, yeah, wait, so what, what sort of weapons are the soldiers carrying? He sense any, you know, uh, 
how's how's the economy how's this what, what the prices i mean fucking everything and um so i go to the cafeteria with my meal ticket um determined to get my first hamburger in <laughs> five weeks and um sit down and and then these three dudes come over shaven head um they're uh they're in civilian clothes but they're obviously military you know big dudes muscular of course they're marines and i start chatting to them and one thing leads to another and they say, hey, come back to the embassy house for a party tonight. I mean, the Marine house. So I did. And it was awesome. And I thought, man, life in the core is, well, this is great. These dudes live in an exotic place. They've got their own uh, Marine house where, I mean, I was single there. Not that it did me any good, but I'm just saying that, you know, they, they were they were like rock stars in Islamabad in the expat community. Um, and so I thought, yeah. You know, I can always go back to doing law, but this is for me. Mm. Uh, first day at Paris Island, I was rather roughly disabused. Of, uh, yeah, I want the plan. I, I, I want the plan where I go straight to Islamabad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, la last question for me, seriously. Uh, after all of this, was your girlfriend in Australia still your girlfriend? Uh, she was. Yeah, oh. actually, we're still friends. Oh, um, cool. yeah. Um, she, did you make it to up, Australia? Yeah, I did, and okay, she put good. up with me for at least another year. Um, I had an awesome time in Australia. Came back, finished my um, finished my law degree, and remembering these dudes, walked into the U.S. Embassy and met the Marine recruiter who was a Brit, um, three time tours in Vietnam. Still didn't have his U.S. citizenship. Wow. <laughs> According to him, I think he was lying because he must have had security clearance. I didn't know. No. I bet he was lying. That wasn't the only thing he lied about, too. By the way. <laughs> and he en and you enlisted into the Marines. Yeah, I finished law school and enlisted. Let but, me ask you, know, you something. Uh, I, I drove yeah. a hard bargain. I was guaranteed PFC out of boot camp. Oh wow, huge! But That's even a big get. even big get. Even more even more exclusive guaranteed infantry. Oh, and I tr uh, yeah, I, I He's rung that, that recruiter. I rang and dry, man. <laughs> Let me ask you, like, don't they teach logic in British law schools? Yeah, that was a big part of philosophy. <laughs> okay. That's the test like, he failed. It's like, uh, it's, like, <laughs> it's like Tom Cruise and an officer and gentleman says to Demi Moore, oh, I forgot. You met, you were sick the one day they taught law at law school. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. All right. That was great. Listen. Check out Andy's Substack. Check out Andy's Twitter. Check out uh, Andy's book. All the links will be in the description. Of course, don't forget to like and subscribe. If you're listening to us on audio, rate and review at five stars. That helps just as much as liking and subscribing on YouTube. Check out the Patreon, patreon.com slash the team house. Links are in the description. The Patreon's important because YouTube is screwing us over and we're trying to build something here. So help us out if you can. Thank you. Please. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone.